Robert and Suzanne Mays have been actively researching NDEs since 2005, although neither has had an NDE. Their research currently focuses on the evidence from NDEs and understanding consciousness and the neurological function that supports ordinary consciousness. Their talk this morning is NDE evidence and the next steps in the mind-brain research. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, and Robert and I heartily welcome you, so good morning. And we want to thank you for getting up so early this morning to be here for this opening talk of the conference. We're going to present the evidence from near-death experiences that the mind of a person is a separate entity that unites with the brain and body in ordinary consciousness. We will then, folk, then discuss how the non-material mind entity works with the brain and what the next step should be in mind-brain research. You can read more about our research at our website, selfconsciousmind.com. What are the factors in the past that enabled the rapid acceptance of a new scientific paradigm? Here are two examples. Based on the ideas of philosopher Herbert Butterfield, we're grateful to researcher Julie Billingham for suggesting Butterfield. In the development of the modern heliocentric theory of planetary motion, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, and Descartes struggled for many years to fit the observed motion of the planets around the sun. There was no comprehensive framework. Certain planetary motions were anomalous and didn't fit their models, which used epicycles, elliptical orbits, or planetary vortices. Isaac Newton developed a new intellectual framework that all bodies of mass attract one another at a distance, the universal law of gravitation, fully explaining the observed planetary motion. In the development of the model of the internal structure of the atom, Lord Kelvin, J.J. Thompson, and Ernest Rutherford proposed several models, particle vortices, the plum pudding model, and the electron cloud model. Again, there was no comprehensive framework, and the problem was thought to be too complex to solve. Niels Bohr proposed the solar system-like model based on Max Planck's new intellectual framework of quantized energy. Bohr's model fit the observed hydrogen spectrum precisely within experimental error. Here are the common threads in the process of past scientific, past scientific revolutions. First, there was the recognition of anomalies, that is, phenomena still needing explanation. A proliferation of theories were proposed to address some of the anomalies, but were formulated under the existing scientific framework, resulting in ad hoc additions to the framework. Finally, there was the realization that, quoting Butterfield, the problem could not be solved within the framework of the older system of ideas. It required a transposition of the mind. Ultimately, leading edge scientists adopted a radically new way of viewing the problem, which led to a new framework and model. Newton proposed that, that gravitation applies to all bodies of mass. Bohr applied uh, Planck's non-continuous quantum energy to the atom, to the electron in the hydrogen atom, and ultimately to all atoms. Therefore, quoting Butterfield, the requirements for a successful scientific revolution are to develop an encompassing approach that grasps the whole in a mighty synthesis. To develop an encompassing approach that Sorry, to establish a, an adequate intellectual framework, one that addresses the anomalies. To describe a theory 
and a model that explains the anomalies, providing a demonstration that fits the facts on the whole when applied to the phenomena in detail. The new theory needs to encompass already understood phenomena. In developing a framework for consciousness, we need to start to ask, what is consciousness? How does it manifest in the world? How does human consciousness survive the death of the physical body? There is a proliferation of theories about consciousness, physicalism, idealism, panpsychism, neutral monism, dualism. Yet the hard problem of consciousness remains. Brain electrical activity closely correlates with conscious awareness, the so-called neural correlates of consciousness. This picture is an MEG, magnetoencephalography image, of a person's brain when she reads a word. The sequence is about four-tenths of a second long. Even so, the close correlation with brain activity does not address the fundamental question of how brain activity produces subjective experiences. We propose that consciousness, that is, the experience of subjective awareness, manifests in the world in living beings, especially in individual human beings. Furthermore, Consciousness needs to be described through the empirical evidence of our own subjective experiences and through the reported experiences of others. Common experiences shared by numerous people can be taken as objectively real. Subjectively, one's awareness has a particular locus. That is, it is located in a particular space, position in space and has a particular perspective or point of view. This is understandable because one is generally embodied in a particular physical body. Also, one experiences different faculties such as perception, thought, feelings, volition, memory, self-awareness, and agency. We call the locus of one's subjective awareness the mind. A new perspective is possible if we expand the existing framework for consciousness to include anomalous experiences of consciousness. Anomalous phenomena are phenomena that can't be readily explained in normal scientific terms, such as experiences reported in NDEs, shared death experiences, after-death communications. Our research focuses on NDEs because NDEers experience vivid, hyperreal awareness while experiencing an apparent separation from the physical body during which their locus of awareness is outside the physical body. There are numerous reported cases during NDEs of verified, accurate, or veridical perceptions of the physical realm while out of body especially while the brain is non-functional. In these cases, the NDE reports particular perceptions in the, in the physical realm from a perspective outside their physical body, which should not have been possible either because their brain was not functional or the object was out, uh, out of their physical line of sight or both. See more than five dozen of these verified cases documented in The Self Does Not Die. Here is case 3.33 of veridical out-of-body perceptions from The Self Does Not Die. Lauren Belge is a critical care physician whose patient Howard suffered a cardiac arrest while recovering from surgery in the ICU. Howard was completely unconscious, but was resuscitated by several defibrillation shocks and was put on a ventilator. Howard later reported that he shot out of the top of his head, saying, I'm looking down on my body and it feels like I'm bobbing and bouncing against the ceiling. With the thought that maybe he was to go somewhere, he says, 
I felt myself rising up through the ceiling. And it was like I was going through the structure of the building. I could feel the different densities of passing through insulation. I saw wiring, some pipes, and then I was in this other room. It looked like a hospital, but it was very quiet, like there was no one there. There were people in beds that looked like mannequins and they had IVs hooked up to them, but they didn't look real. In the center was an open area that looked like a collection of workstations with computers. Right above his ICU room is a nurse training center with medical mannequins on some of the beds. And in the center, a collection of workspaces with computers. Dr. Belge and the attending nurse were astonished at the accuracy of Howard's description. And because the presence of the nurse training center was not generally known, not even by non-nursing staff. The number of these cases and the weight of evidence in them is strong enough to assert that the locus of awareness has in fact separated from the physical body. Veridical perceptions from a vantage point separate from the body, particularly while the brain is non-functional, imply that the locus of one's subjective awareness can function independent of the physical brain. They imply that one's awareness, the mind, in general, can separate from the physical body and operate independently of it. Conceptually, the mind ceases to be a byproduct of brain neural activity and can now be viewed as an autonomous conscious entity. The concept of a mind entity separate from the physical body can serve as a new intellectual framework for explaining consciousness. Evidence from numerous NDEs gives a picture of the nature of the out-of-body mind. First, during an NDE, the mind functions as a cohesive unit. The NDE experiences that their entire being has separated from the body. There is a continuity of subjective awareness throughout the separation and return. Even in cases of bouncing repeatedly in and out of body like a ping pong ball. All aspects of their mind or self are still consciously present to them throughout the NDE. Subjectively, the NDE experiences all cognitive faculties. The out-of-body NDE does not identify with the physical body. Some NDEers exclaim, that physical body wasn't me. The out-of-body mind is objectively real. The end of the ear can be seen by animals. Jerry floated over a school playground just located just north of the hospital. There were lots of children playing outside there. A German shepherd dog was playing with the children. Jerry floated down to investigate. The dog sensed his presence and playfully barked at him. Jerry positioned himself just a few inches above where the dog could jump, teasing the animal by staying just out of reach. The dog barked and jumped up at him, wagging his tail excitedly, barking. Jerry told us that he and the dog looked into each other's eyes. I was moving up, down, and to the sides. We moved together like a dance. NDE ears can also be seen by other people. An apparitional NDE is a particular event in an NDE in which the out-of-body NDE ear visits and communicates in some way with a living person. 
and both accounts of the encounter are subsequently verified to be consistent with one another. There are seven verified apparitional cases documented in The Self Does Not Die. These experiences strongly suggest that a person's mind is a separate entity that is independent of the body. The mind is objectively real, a real thing, a real being. All faculties of cognition occur in the mind, not in the brain. In effect, the separate mind is the essence of the person. The separation of the mind from the body in general is a general phenomenon. The mind can separate from the body under many different circumstances, not just near death as in cardiac arrest, severe trauma, or coma. There are also NDE-like cases that are not close to death, as in fainting, sleep, meditation, alcohol, or drugs. The locus of the person's awareness separates even though the brain is still functional. Such cases are called near-death-like experiences, NDLEs. <coughs> The subjective experience of NDEs and NDLEs are indistinguishable with the same number and intensity of NDE elements. Therefore, NDEs are a general phenomenon regardless of the antecedent causes. This fact implies there is a common proximate cause for all NDEs and NDLEs regardless of antecedent causes. The main common feature of all NDE and NDE-like experiences is the separation of the locus of subjective awareness from the body. Therefore, we propose that the common proximate cause of all NDE and NDE-like experiences is the actual separation of the mind from the physical body rather than any other antecedent cause. The NDE evidence so far indicates the mind is a separate entity that can separate from and operate independently of the physical body. The mind entity is an objectively real thing, a real being. All faculties of cognition occur in the mind not in the brain. Out-of-body NDEs experience easily passing through solid objects like walls. Recall the case of Lauren Belge's patient, Howard. Therefore, the mind appears to be non-material, not made up of material particles, atoms, and molecules. The mind can merge and be coextensive with physical objects like the body and brain. Our mind entity hypothesis states, the human being consists of a non-material mind or locus of awareness that is united, coextensive, and integrated with the physical body. The mind entity is the seat of consciousness of the person. All cognitive faculties reside in the mind, not in the brain. There are two possible states of awareness, the in-body state and the out-of-body state. For the in-body state, there is a close correlation between brain neural activity and subjective awareness. Therefore, the mind entity is completely dependent on the brain's electrical activity for subjective awareness. The mind entity must interact with the brain to achieve subjective awareness of mental content and to effect willed movement. For the out-of-body state in an NDE, the mind entity separates from the body 
and operates independent of the brain. For this theory to be consonant with existing scientific knowledge, there must be some form of causal energetic interaction between the mind and the brain and some plausible mechanism of interaction. How could a non-material mind interact with the material brain to achieve consciousness? There is strong evidence that the out-of-body mind does interact with physical processes, with light, sound waves in the air, and solid matter, giving rise to subjective sensations and accurate veridical perceptions in the physical realm. There are also numerous reports from NDEers encounter a subtle resistance or increased density when passing through solid matter. Again, recall the case of NDEer Howard passing through different layers of insulation. This implies a new subtle push-pull force when the out-of-body mind entity passes through solid matter, like passing your hand through water. According to Newton's third law of motion, for every force of one object on another, there is an equal and opposite opposing force. There is also evidence that NDEers can interact with the neural processes of an in-body person. Example, an NDE passed her hand through the doctor's arm and felt something that was the consistency of very rarefied gelatin that seemed to have an electric current running through it. Example, an NDE reported tickling the nose of a patient with dementia, causing her to sneeze. Therefore, the evidence indicates the mind can interact with matter and specifically with neural electrical processes, both to sense and to trigger neural electrical activity. Most philosophers and scientists reject dualist theories like ours because they think it's impossible for a non-material mind to interact with a physical brain. They consider consciousness purely the result of brain processes. We address the philosophical objections to interactionist dualism. First, there is strong evidence that the out-of-body mind interacts with physical processes, giving rise to phenomenal perceptions in the NDEer's mind. And there is evidence that a subtle previously unrecognized two-way force is involved in mind-matter interactions. There are three specific philosophical challenges to interactionist dualism. First, taking the mind to be a thing is a category error because the mind is simply the collection of a person's dispositions and capacities resulting from brain activity. So minds are in a different category from physical objects like brains. However, the non-material mind is actually in the same category as physical objects because the mind is an objectively real thing that unites with the brain and body. Secondly, the causal pairing problem of how a non-material mind existing outside physical space can causally interact with a physical object like a brain. Any causal interaction must occur in spatial relation to the physical object. In our view, the non-material mind is a three-dimensional object in a physical space, which merges and pairs with the physical brain. The mind and brain are located in intimate spatial relation to one another and exert direct 
causal interactions with each other. Third, the causal closure of the physical, stating that all physical effects have only physical causes. In our theory, the mind is non-material, yet interacts with physical processes and thus takes part in physical causation. The mind interfaces with the brain at specific points of contact at the surface of the cortex. The question remains, how does the mind interface with the brain? Because the end of ear retains all cognitive faculties while out of body, these faculties reside in the mind, not in the brain. Even in the ordinary consciousness, all faculties of cognition and all mental content originate in the mind. However, the mind entity is completely dependent on the brain's electrical activity for subjective awareness. Therefore, in ordinary consciousness, the mind must work through the brain's neural activity for subjective awareness, even awareness of its own mental content. Neuroscientist Benjamin Libet found that it takes time for neural activation to build up to conscious awareness. Yeah. Libet's time on principle is that subjective awareness requires a minimum duration of 300 to 500 milliseconds of neural activity. Otherwise, the stimulus remains unconscious, a subliminal stimulation. Libet distinguished between detection and subjective awareness. Before awareness begins, the stimulus is still detected, and one can still respond within 100 milliseconds. For example, a baseball batter can adjust his swing before being subjectively aware of the pitch. Even without subjective awareness, subliminal stimulations are detected and have an effect. It's a phenomenon called subliminal priming. The stimulus is detected even at its first appearance with a so-called evoked potential in the brain, and then goes through a process of coming to awareness. Because the initial appearance was detected, the person knows when the stimulus started, even though the sensation was subliminal for 300 milliseconds or longer. This is called the backward referral in time. The process of coming to awareness applies to all awareness, awareness of sensory perceptions and also of inward or endogenous thoughts, imaginations, etc. Libet's findings have now been confirmed in more recent studies of what's called conscious processing. In our view, the mind is engaged throughout the process of coming to awareness. From detection of a stimulus to subjective awareness, the mind adds its mental content by impressing the content on the specific brain regions for that cognitive function. The neural activations in these regions bring the mental content to subjective awareness. The primary purpose of cortical neural activations is to bring the mind's mental content to subjective awareness. So does, to explore how the mind works with the brain, we'd like to examine what goes on in the brain when we read a word. Here's an example of the brain activity with electroencephalography, EEG, when a person reads a single word. EEG measures the electrical voltage at different areas on the scalp. Blue-green here means minus voltage. When reading words one by one, an incongruent word in a sentence evokes a strong minus voltage at the top of the scalp. 
in the, in the graph, minus voltages are plotted up and time is on the x-axis. In reading a word, there is a typical pattern of electrical activity for about half a second. Ordinarily, the pattern follows this lower trace, the black line. But when one reads an incongruent word in a sentence, there is an unusual strong minus voltage at the top of the scalp, peaking at 400 milliseconds, called N400. When we read words in a sentence, the earlier words establish the context. Then when we read the next word, as in the Dutch trains are yellow, the word yellow fits the context of Dutch trains. So, in our view, the full process for reading a single word happens this way. At 115 milliseconds, the N1 minus voltage peak is associated with detecting the word percept, the form of the word. The target word in the sentence shown here is Y-E-L-L-O-W, as in the Dutch strains are yellow. At 200 milliseconds, the P2 plus voltage peak is associated with detecting the meaning of the word, the meaning or concept of yellow, namely a bright, warm color. At 400 milliseconds, the minus voltage peak is associated with awareness of how congruent or incongruent the word is in the context. Yellow is congruent because the Dutch strains are in fact yellow. That's an example of world knowledge. And the trace follows the typical neural pattern of the black line. If we say the Dutch trains are white or sour, there is a large peak at N400 because white is incongruent and sour is really anomalous. So percep perception and comprehension proceed in three distinct stages in time. First, detect the form of the word. Second, recognize the meaning of the word. Finally, evaluate the word's meaning in the current context as the word comes to awareness. The mind is involved at each stage. In reading a single word, the mind also engages three specific regions of the brain. Magnetoencephalography, MEG, uses the brain's magnetic fields to indicate where electrical activity in the brain occurs. These are MEG recordings of a person reading a single word. In the case shown here, it's a novel word that produces a large N400. The neural activations are shown in red and yellow and occur sequentially in three different brain regions. These regions correspond to the three EEG peaks on the previous slide. One, detecting the form of the word in the occipital region on the inside surface of the hemispheres. Two, intuiting the meaning of the word or concept on the outside surface in the visual word form area and occipital temporal area. And three, evaluating the congruence of the word in the current context in temporal and prefrontal regions. In the third stage, as words are read, each new word adds to and builds the context of the sentence. The context is held in the mind. Note that there is a gap in the timing when activity in one region starts falling after its peak between steps one and two and steps two and three. The activity in one region starts falling before the next region's activity starts up. In our view, these are the times that the mind is impressing its mental content on the next brain region followed by the neural activity in that region. In our model, neural activations are needed to bring mental content to conscious awareness. So the mind must first impress its conceptual content on the appropriate brain regions, inducing neural activations. 
the neural activations in those regions act as a mirror to bring the mental content to awareness. Neural activations indicate that the mind's mental content is in the process of coming to awareness. This next diagram is a schematic view of this process, showing the brain and the mind coextensive with it. In actuality, the mind closely interfaces, interfaces just with the surface of the cortex. Very briefly, the, in ordinary consciousness, the mind interfaces and works with the brain by inducing neural firing that allows the mental content in the mind to come to awareness. In a little more detail, the mind first impresses its mental content, for example, the meaning of a word, on a brain region. The neural activation in that region acts as a mirror to bring the mental content to awareness. Here's how we view now the involvement of the mind in the stages of reading a word in context. At 115 milliseconds, the mind detects the percept, the form of the word. In, the, in this case, the word is W-H-I-T-E. In the sentence, the Dutch strains are white in the occipital region. The mind decodes the percept as the form of an English word, the word white, and intuits the concept or meaning of white. After the peak, Based on this content, the mind impresses the meaning of the color white on the next regions, the visual word form area and related language regions. The meaning of white is still subliminal at this point. The neural activity in these regions begins. At 165 milliseconds, the mind detects the meaning of the concept white. The mind evaluates the incongruity of the color white in the context of Dutch trains. After the peak, the mind impresses the incongruity of Dutch trains being white on the next regions, the temporal and prefrontal areas. The incongruity is still subliminal at this point. The neural activity in these regions begins. At 400 milliseconds, the mind comes to awareness of the incongruity of white in the context of Dutch trains. The mind entity model is applicable to all conscious experience. We propose this is the way consciousness works. There are two largely distinct complementary brain networks shown in this map of the brain, showing the two sides of the left hemisphere with its outside and its inside surfaces. The two complementary networks are, first, an externally directed perceptual and motor system involving sensory areas in yellow. The mind impresses its semantic content here to recognize and interpret perceptions. Second, an inwardly directed conceptual system used in semantic tasks. That's called the default network in red. The mind impresses its semantic content here for inward thought, such as daydreaming, solving a mental problem, planning a shopping list, etc. In this model, the mind is engaged effectively throughout the neocortex with external sensory processes, with external motor processes, with inward sources of information. The mind impresses its mental content in all cortical regions except the purely input modalities in the primary sensory areas. The mind entity theory is a radical departure from the prevalent physicalist view in neuroscience. In this theory, all mental content comes from the mind and is impressed on brain regions, causing neural activations which bring the content to subjective awareness. So in this theory, the brain does not generate mental content, nor is mental content and memory retained in brain structures. 
nor does the brain perform mental computations. In this theory, semantic memory, working memory, episodic memory, and implicit or pattern memory are all carried in the mind, not in brain structures. So in this theory, there are no memory traces in the cortex, hippocampus, or cerebellum. Long-term potentiation serves not to store mental content as traces, but rather to facilitate memory formation in the mind and memory recall from the mind. The specialized memory structures in the hippocampus for episodic memory and the cerebellum for pattern memory act as specialized interfaces with the mind. The brain's function is to support the mind in its perceptual and inward endogenous mental processes. The brain's neural action potentials act as a mirror that enables the mind to come to awareness of its cognitive content. Specific cognitive content is mirrored in specialized brain regions, for example, the fusiform face area, the visual word form area, etc. From the mind entity theory, the word the mind impresses its mental content on cortical neurons and causes action potentials, which bring the mental content to awareness. This implies that the interface of the mind with the brain is at the surface of the cortex in the gray matter. The gray matter contains pyramidal neurons with vertical apical dendrites reaching from the soma to the surface of the cortex and basal dendrites branching out horizontally from the soma. On the dendrites, there are innumerable nodules called dendritic spines. The mind must be able to trigger action potentials in pyramidal neurons and in some way sense the resulting action potentials. Out-of-body and the ears can directly sense neural activity in an in-body person. Therefore, the mind most likely senses the back propagations of action potentials when they spread back throughout the dendritic arbor, as this figure shows. The question now is, how does the mind trigger action potentials? Volatile inhalation anesthetics provide evidence for how the mind operates with the brain. Volatile anesthetics like diethyl ether or isoflurane readily cause the loss of consciousness and therefore inhibit the action of the mind. Volatile anesthetics also alter the properties of the dendritic spines on the pyramidal neurons. The dendrite here is in green and the spines are the red structures. The volatile anesthetics pass through the spine wall and unravel the spine's cytoskeleton, causing the spines temporarily to shrink and collapse. This diagram shows the effects of isoflurane. The normal spine structure is at, shown at the top. In the middle is with isoflurane at clinical concentrations, the spines have shrunk and collapsed. These effects are reversed at the bottom when the anesthetic is washed out and the cytoskeleton has reassembled. The dendritic spines contain an internal cytoskeleton consisting of microfilaments of a substance called F-actin. The F-actin filaments maintain the spine shape and rigidity and help with vesicle movement in the spine. F-actin filaments are polymers of a basic actin unit strung together. These structural filaments are unraveled by volatile anesthetics and can subsequently be reassembled. The important thing here is volatile anesthetics cause the loss of consciousness. They also unravel the F-actin filaments in dendritic spines. Because these facts appear to be related, we propose that the interface for the mind to trigger action potentials is located in the dendritic spines. The mechanism of interaction must rely on interaction of the mind 
with spine effectant filaments and would be disrupted by anesthetics, preventing mind-induced neuroactivity and subjective awareness. We believe such an interface and mechanism exists in the dendritic spines. This is a schematic of a dendritic spine with its spine head, spine neck, connected to its dendrite, taken from a book by researcher Rafael Yuste. Numerous affectin filaments maintain the structure of the spine neck and spine head. At the center are several stores of positively charged calcium ions in a collection of vesicles called the spine apparatus. The spine apparatus also has effactin filaments associated with it. In our view, the mind can trigger release of calcium ions from the spine apparatus by interacting with the spine apparatus filaments, causing a kind of mind-induced calcium release. The positive calcium ions flow into the dendrite and induce dendritic spikes, which can then trigger an action potential. The action potential, in turn, causes the influx of calcium ions back throughout the spines. The calcium ions are stored again in the spine apparatus, resetting the neuron for further action potentials. Similar action-driven, sorry, calcium-driven mechanisms are well understood and operate throughout the body, for example, in regulating the heartbeat. Volatile anesthetics unravel effactin filaments in the spine such that the mind can't trigger the release of calcium ions from the spine apparatus. This prevents mind-induced action potentials and causes loss of consciousness because the mental content remains unconscious. When the anesthetic has washed out, the effectin reforms, enabling consciousness to return. In this view, the mind triggers action potentials only by triggering the spine effectin filaments. The force needed to trigger the actin filaments is likely very small, probably comparable to the subtle resistance in the ears report when passing through solid matter. In contrast, the force of the action potential propagating back through the dendritic arbor can be inferred in this image of a series of action potentials. The energy of the back propagation resets the neuron for further action potentials, allowing it to achieve high firing rates. In the mind entity theory, the mind impresses its mental content on all critical regions, yellow and red, except in the primary sensory regions for sight, hearing, and touch. Since the primary sensory areas are purely input modalities, the mind does not impress its mental content in these, in these areas. These points suggest that there should be more dendritic spines in the yellow and red regions compared to the primary sensory regions. This prediction is validated by studies done by Guy Elston, for example, shown here in estimating the number of spines in different regions of the cortex. In the human being, the dendritic spine densities are significantly higher in the temporal and frontal lobes compared with the occipital lobe. Recalling Herbert Butterfield's thesis, a true revolution in science requires a transposition in thinking that grasps the whole in a broader synthesis of the phenomena, creating a conceptual framework that explains the anomalies. We propose that the concept of an autonomous mind entity can serve as a new conceptual framework for explaining consciousness. Physicist William Bragg said, the important thing in science is not so much to obtain new facts as to discover new ways of thinking about them. There are several avenues to help scientists make the mental transposition to this new framework. The first approach is, is to show that the new framework better explains existing neurological phenomena, phenomena that are well known but not fully understood. These would include consciousness, semantic knowledge, perception, etc. 
Secondly, show that the new framework explains the anomalies of neuroscience. For example, like split brain phenomena, phantom limb phenomena. Third, validate the proposed mind-brain mechanisms through improved clinical therapies and results. For example, therapies apply to disorders of consciousness, like unresponsive wakeful state and minimally conscious state. Finally, validate the proposed mind-brain mechanisms through experimental testing. For example, the interaction of a mind's energetic field with neurons, experimenting with a squid giant axon. For example, the interaction of a healer's energetic field with a subject's brain and body and validated by MRI or MEG scans. Thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, we, have, we have time for some questions uh, right there from Chuck. Hey, phenomenal. Uh, what you've done is really, yeah, you've moved the yardsticks in an incredible way. A um, couple of observations. You know, this really does tie the non-material to the material significantly. The side of it that kind of leaves open is how do we talk about the synthesis of identity, if you understand, because you said, I think it was the non-material mind would be a 3D. But we know that in the experiencer land, the elements of time and distance disappear. So that makes 3D a little harder to uh, map. But, you know, to get there, you've taken a step that we, we really have to hold you up as, you know, pioneers in this field. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Chuck. Is there any work being done with functional MRI and near-death experience? No, uh, the difficulty with fMRI, at least in our view, uh, and near-death experience is uh, that if the NDE leaves the physical body, then there will be no fMRI um, signals. Uh, and to catch somebody having an NDE in an MRI uh, would be really anomalous uh, or lucky. Uh, so that's probably not going to be done experimentally. But, but it does indicate that, um, you know, there is this connection between the mind and the brain when you are in an fMRI and you're conscious. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, next. Thank you so much. As a non-scientist, you made that very understandable, and I really appreciate that. I was able to really follow. That's um, what our hope was, that we wouldn't put everybody to sleep. You did it. It was informative. It was good, simple English, and I appreciate that. My question is, uh, from the framework of definition, I think defined terms are so very important, and I'm curious why you're using the word mind instead of soul or consciousness, something that may be more broadly recognized over the centuries. That's my question. Right, and, and we chose that at the very beginning of our research, what shall we call this? If we had called it my, a soul, uh, we would have turned off a lot of uh, let's say, materialistic-minded people uh, and be, been dismissed more readily than we have been dismissed. So uh, we chose mind for that. But we mean the same thing as the essence of a person. You are a spiritual being inside a physical body, and your mind or your soul, your psyche, is all the same thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have uh, less than three so next question, please. <laughs> uh, my experience, uh, I was put into a chemically induced coma, which I think is a volatile anesthetic. Probably. How does that show up in your research? Because uh, I don't remember anything. Right. Uh, well, you would, yeah, as long as the concentration of the anesthetic is there, your mind is not going to be able to interact with the brain and therefore you will be unconscious. Uh, it allows your body obviously with an induced, uh, medically induced coma to 
um, recover. Uh, and then when they feel that you're okay enough, uh, they will reduce the anesthetic gradually and uh, then you will begin to be uh, conscious and they will monitor how you're doing there. They will reduce it more and um, yeah, reduce the anesthetic more and more and then you become fully conscious. So the mind is asleep also, the consciousness is well, the mind is is the mind is not connected to the brain. So it, I, I imagine, although my experience is that it doesn't happen. I imagine you can have, uh, you know, uh, transcendent experiences during coma, uh, yeah, induced coma. But I, uh, and I think that some people have that, have had that. Yeah. Thank you. Next, please. A couple minutes left. Yes, I have. Um... Uh, read accounts where people who have had heart transplants have memories of the people of the heart, and so I'm just one that the that the heart came from, and I'm just wondering how does that relate to your research of where memories are held? Yes, well, the memories are held in the mind, and the mind is is a complex thing. Part of the mind is connected to the physical body. Uh, in some traditions, it's called the etheric body, and so when one accepts an organ that is you know from some another person then the in the in that at that energy level the memories exist and then can be in you know manifest uh it's not you it's your heart your transplanted heart uh but but then that influences you and that's the way we would view that that's the way we do view that okay yeah. thank you thank you Two more questions. Stage left. I've heard reports of NDEers who have left their body in the process of going to the other side, surviving, coming back, and recalling. One in particular, someone drove over the cliff into the ocean, came out of their body, so they saw the car go down. But they also heard themselves screaming in the car on the way down. Yeah. It would be an indication of separation, but at the same time, the body seeming to function yeah. without the mind being present. And your thoughts on that? Well, exactly that, that the body functions, continues to function without, um, you know, you being present and you can observe it. And and there are some interesting cases where an NDE is, is undergoing uh, a, a drug, uh, drug uh, hallucinations in the physical body is out of body watching his body having hallucinations. So it, it there is this separation and there is this kind of automatic uh, uh, reactions, reflexive reactions in the physical body. Yeah. Thank you. And lastly, thank you very much. So my question is, does your research indicate the presence of mind or soul in, in animals in any way? Oh, yes. Well, our research doesn't, but we, we let's say, know that um, uh, animals have souls. And uh, they're somewhat different, um, and their brains are different. Uh, but basically, they and, and of course, animals appear in NDEs. Uh, you know, uh, deceased animals appear in NDEs. So yes, they have souls. <laughs> they you. are minds. Well, thank you very much. Please give a big round of applause, Robert Mays. Thank you both very much. You'll be seeing them later, of course. <laughs>